Um, but it is a oh, okay. It is a long weekend holiday for us. So uh, many folks from the U.S. Thanks for taking time out of the long weekend. So and everybody else too. Um, so on the screen, you will see the abstract that I submitted. Um, I wrote this abstract in 2020, November of 2020, not knowing what talk I was actually going to write when the time came. By then, um, this is the end of November, we knew that Trump had lost the election and that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris would be occupying the White House on the day that I actually delivered the, these remarks. But other than that, from the vantage point of November 2020, July 2021 was a total mystery to me other than knowing that the underlying problems that brought us President Trump would remain once there was no longer a President Trump. Because after all, Trump was always just the tip of the iceberg, or more appropriately, he was always just an apex predator within a much larger information ecology. And that's a representation of said ecology. So apex predators are uniquely dangerous and influential, of course, that should go without saying, but they're also utterly dependent on the rest of the ecosystem. Take away their prey, take away their prey's prey, take away the ecological conditions that sustain the overall biomass, and the lions and tigers and bears are not gonna have a chance to survive. So dealing with someone like Trump doesn't mean merely getting rid of Trump, certainly not when the ecological conditions that nourished him persist. So the January 6th insurrection, followed by our, the United States' slower moving insurrection aimed at voting rights, um, propped up the big lie that uh, Joe Biden stole the election, only underscores the fact in the US that while Trump might be off Twitter and three cheers for that, Trumpism is alive and well here. And everything that was dangerous about Trump's presidency, notably the disregard for the rule of law, the simmering disdain for majority rule uh, democracy is just as dangerous now, maybe even more so. So with the stark July 2021 reminder that it's not even clear what part of the woods we've entered, let alone when we'll be out of them, the question is what do we do at the policy and educational and ethical level? I'm very sorry, I don't have the answers, but I would like to share three ideas that I think warrant consideration as we figure out where we can and should and must go next, with each having the potential to inform how we think about policy interventions as well as more everyday ethical interventions. Here are these three. So these three ideas are that information issues are also mental health issues, that solutions need to be directed towards causes, not just symptoms at both the network and at the personal level, and that there's a fundamental tension between individual interventions and structural interventions. And I'm currently weaving and worrying about all three issues in a middle grades book, so sixth, seventh, eighth grade book. I'm currently writing with my co-author Ryan Milner, which is loosely based on our most recent book, You Are Here, but has since taken on a life of its own. And I'd be happy to talk about that book and the adaptation process in the q and It's been quite something. So right out of the gate, it might be a little bit surprising that I would be foregrounding mental health and a talk ultimately about online ethics. And that's because problems with information tend to focus, I mean, go figure, on the information itself. You've got an info problem, great, here's an info problem solution. And that makes sense. But when too much attention is paid to the information itself, the person who is engaging with that information is very often overlooked. It becomes information shared by a phantom, when in fact the flesh and blood person is as important to the story as the information itself. Research on social media fatigue and overwhelm and exhaustion helps explain how that works. And, and this work, which spans a variety of disciplines, describes how draining our various screens can be. We were just talking a minute ago about how tiring Zoom is. It's sort of like a reverse, not just Zoom, but all of our screens in, total, in totality, sort of like a reverse battery recharge for our minds. Fatigue and overwhelm and exhaustion, all these feelings, they feel bad and that's bad enough. But what's even worse is that evidence suggests that feeling bad on social media can actually contribute to sharing bad information. So 
For example, computer scientist Namjul Islam and his team found that people experiencing social media fatigue tended to share more false stories about the COVID-19 pandemic. And I've observed the same pattern in my students who admit to sharing all kinds of post first, verify later content when trying to make sense of a stressful news story or situation. And social media fatigue also factors into discussions around doom scrolling. Journalist Karen Ho popularized this idea to describe what happens when people scroll and scroll and scroll on social media, even though it makes them tired and sad and sometimes extremely anxious and scared. And I can vouch for this too in my classroom when I taught uh, the two sections of the 2020 election class in the fall, which still makes me tired just thinking about it. My students connected the dots explicitly between doom scrolling and knee jerk sharing as and many of them explained in class, the more doomy their scrolling was the more likely they were to share stuff even untrue stuff just to feel like they were doing something. Social media fatigue and doom scrolling are both specific to social media, of course, but anyone who has been really tired or really hungry or really stressed out has probably had similar kinds of offline experiences too. I just did myself because I was in my kitchen trying to make lunch when I opened up my cupboard and realized that a bag of potatoes had rotted. And when I picked it up, it dripped rotten potato water all over my foot. And that totally shifted my ability to figure out what I need to do next. I have to go get laundry, but how do you do it? Because I got so overwhelmed in that moment and also rotten potato water is disgusting. And this is standard brain stuff as a neuroscientist Amshi Jha explains. When we feel overwhelmed, our attention, exactly what we need to assess information and make careful choices is significantly weakened. And we also lose the ability to regulate our emotions. We simply don't have the cognitive fuel. So when stress goes up, we are much more likely to do something that we end up regretting. When we're at the grocery store, for example, and the line is taking too long and we are being pestered by somebody, maybe a child, maybe a partner, maybe the person in front of us, and we have somewhere else to be or would just rather be anywhere else other than there, and we have other things, more pressing things on our mind, and we get asked exactly the wrong question by exactly the wrong person in exactly the wrong way, we tend to not be the most generous versions of ourselves. Many of us lash out. We say something we wish we wouldn't, or at the very least, we think something we wish we wouldn't. And the same basic process unfolds on social media all the time, though there's more distractions, more and louder pestering, and stores we can never leave because we carry them around in our pocket. Whether they happen offline or online, these kinds of reactions are powered by our limbic brain, more commonly known as the lizard brain or reptilian brain. It's the oldest part of our brain that's responsible for assessing threats and keeping us safe. And when the lizard brain perceives danger, it starts yelling, threat, 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 this is wrong, we have to do something. And suddenly we're fighting or we're fleeing or we're freezing. And sometimes our lizard brains are exactly right. We really are in danger and need to react immediately like by jumping out of the way of an oncoming car. But the lizard brain also has the tendency to be a wee bit overreactive and often sees threats when there aren't any. So no matter how right or wrong it is though, your lizard brain, it limits your perspective to just the threat or what you think the threat is. And reactions that come from a fight, flight, freeze place, they might feel right in the moment, but they tend not to solve or do anything about underlying problems. And they can even make things worse because fighting, flighting, and freezing, it's not a plan. Your lizard brain isn't thinking about the future. It's thinking about this particular moment and how it can punch its way out. Online, the lizard brain very easily sets us up for what my co-author Ryan and I are calling a pollution chain reaction, which goes a little something like this. We're overwhelmed and we post or say something from a fight, flight, freeze place. And this ends up polluting other people's chats or feeds or makes them very angry, either because the information is false or misleading or because the information is simply stressful. There's too much of it, or it doesn't line up with the social signals that others have been sending us to like maybe stop sending us text messages, oh my God. But however it's generated, our pollution contributes to other people's tired frazzle, which increases the likelihood that they too are gonna start sharing from this lizardy place. Raising the group's overall pollution levels even more, 
I'm going to be talking about the term pollution in just a minute, and, and raising people's stress even more, sort of looping us back to the start of this cycle. So what we're trying to do in the children's book is focus on how what we share is fundamentally tangled up in how we're doing. And in addition to highlighting the relationship between mental health and information, we're providing tips on how to feel a little bit better so we can share a little bit better. And these include immediate calm down strategies like I just had to use when I got that potato water all over my foot, and as well as longer term strategies to help prevent triggering pollution chain reactions for others. And, and we're drawing out conclusions from empirical work that's already been done as well as very consistent behavioral patterns that both Milner and I, we both teach media literacy classes um, that we have observed in our classroom and our own lives studying everything that's terrible on the internet for over a decade. But there's a lot more work to be done and moving forward, I hope more people start to do it. So that's one area where I, I think as we move forward, that's a place to think about how do we direct policy interventions, how do we direct behavioral inventions. Another area where there's been some work already, but there's lots more room for lots more, um, particularly when thinking about these long term solutions within the nonprofit and governmental educational and entertain entertainment section sector, excuse me, is, is what I sort of loosely describe as beneath the line thinking. So central to this conversation is the idea of the circle of awareness. This comes from psychologist Tara Brock, who some of you might be are familiar with her work. Um, she uses that idea to describe the stuff that we are consciously aware of, that's everything above the line, and the stuff that we're not consciously aware of, that's everything below the line. And Brock is talking about, in, in particular, how the things below the line influence, if not outright control, the things that are above. And she's talking about individual personal psychology, and I'm going to get to that in just a small way in a minute. But this idea also maps really well onto broader discussions about public debate and controversy online. So I'll start with the network circle. So above the line are all the things we actually are encountering on social media. So hashtags, comments, themes, TikToks, audio files, whatever. Anything that makes its way onto your feed or which you personally are contributing to your feeds. Below the line are all the socio-technological dynamics that influence what you see and how you see it. And the children's book is focusing on four in particular. So affordances, it's what technologies allow people to do with them from content creation to social sharing. And central to these affordances is the ability to take things from their original context and zoom them out to God knows where, causing all kinds of ethical whoopsies when people don't even really know what they're looking at, let alone what to do about it. The attention economy, of course, tethers advertising money to clicks and likes and shares. It hoovers up and commoditizes user data. It transforms communities into markets and ensures that the content that does best is the content that's most emotionally resonant, often of the negative variety. And what the attention economy tends to obscure as a result is the calmer and slower and more positive things, which unfortunately tend to be less good for clicks. And the next thing that's worth reflecting on below the line is algorithms, of course, sets of instructions for completing tasks. Though when people use the word algorithm to describe social media sites, they're typically referring to a very particular kind of algorithm, recommendation algorithms, which recommend things, go figure, in turn influencing what you're encountering online. And it's sort of like how a docent in a museum takes you on a tour of all the different art uh, or a uh, and highlight certain things um, as opposed to other things within the museum. Or it's that they notice that you like a particular kind of painting, say you seemed interested in a, in, a, in a painting of a horse, and then they take you to all the other examples of that within the museum at the expense of all the other stuff that they could have shown you. Assumptions are another important thing to consider when we're reflecting on what happens below the line. This is because technologies are inherently socio-technological, because people are the ones who develop them and people have a lot of baggage. In the children's book, we're focusing on a few assumptions in particular. So one is that more information is always better. It's not what I'm saying. It's the assumption that, that, that was made and shaped how uh, social platforms were built. Another was assumptions about the marketplace of ideas that is most prevalent in the United States where we have a sort of pathological obsession, not all of us, some of us, 
think about the marketplace of ideas in certain kinds of ways born out of liberalism on top of which um, our governmental structure was built. We also uh, are talking about assumptions about particular kinds of freedoms, again, not restricted to the US, but a particular sort of pathology within the United States that is more concerned about protecting individuals from outside interference, so negative freedoms, than protecting the group so that all members can enjoy their freedoms equally, positive freedoms. In the children's book, we're describing these dynamics as the winds of social media. We know that dynamics are there, just like you can know that the actual winds are there by looking at all the leaves being blown around. But the dynamics themselves, like the wind, are it's not immediately visible in itself. And that's why you have to work even harder to look below the line, since we'll never get a full picture of what's happening, why it's happening, and what needs to be done about it if we're only looking at the leaves on the ground rather than what brought them to that particular spot. But this above and below the line conversation shouldn't end with the networks themselves. The what exists below our personal spheres of awareness also plays a major role in what ends up in our networks. So to really understand what we encounter on social media, we need to look at the people who are using it. So to set this conversation up, I'm sure many of you have a tab open with Twitter. Um, take a look and scroll for a second. Um, and, and what you're seeing, or take out your phones, um, what you're seeing as you scroll there, or I mean, if you're on Facebook too, whatever, scroll for a minute, what you're seeing is subject to all of the below the line network stuff that I just discussed. Everything you personally do on the internet or see on the internet is subject to or filtered by or amplified via a range of these socio-technological dynamics, the winds of social media. But the personal circle also asks us to consider the hidden world of conditioning and beliefs and stories that we tell ourselves that compel us to share the kinds of things that you just scrolled through. So ocean layers provide a visual framework for understanding this dynamic. I like metaphors, they help me. Um, the, the comments and hashtags and reactions that people post along with the stories that they're actively telling and the feelings they're publicly emoting, that all composes the sunlight zone. Uh, that's all the stuff, if you were just scrolling, that's all the stuff you're seeing there. It's the sunlight zone, it's visible. Everything in the sunlight zone is above the line of awareness, making it very easy to identify and importantly for researchers to measure. Everything under the sunlight zone starts to go beneath the line of awareness. And in the context of public debate and controversy, it's not just that there is so much else besides the sunlight zone to consider. It's that the sunlight zone and everything that flourishes there is fundamentally shaped by what happens in the twilight zone, midnight zone, and the abyss, each of which is murkier than the last. So as an example, economist uh, Robert Schiller demonstrates how narratives below the line of awareness drive everything from individual financial decisions to major cultural events like the 1929 stock market crash in the US. And for Schiller, these narratives can span different zones. A person might have vague awareness of the narratives that influence their behavior, at least in the sense that certain narratives feel familiar or comforting, hastening a person's acceptance of an idea or person um, or action. For instance, Schiller describes the successful businessman narrative, which he argues influenced people's perceptions of Donald Trump. Trusting that narrative or feeling familiar with that narrative made a lot of people think, yeah, why not? He, he could be president. But in other cases, the narratives exist within a midnight zone of awareness. People don't know they're there and don't know that or how their worldviews are being shaped by those narratives. And there are other things to consider beneath the line as well. In our new book, Ryan Milner and I, we discuss what we call deep mimetic frames, the lenses that shape how a person sees the world around them. And this idea is drawing from three critical concepts in communication studies. They're deep because the frames feel so true viscerally in a person's body. They're mimetic because they're, result, they're the result of social exchange. They're not just handed down from on high. They're remixed and reconfigured by people and evolve as they're passed between groups and across generations. And they're frames because they shape how a person interprets or even encounters information. Deep mimetic frames provide the foundation for many of the narratives that, that Schiller is describing. At the most basic level, they're determining the good guys and the bad guys of a person's worldview. 
These frames, though, are particularly powerful drivers of belief in action because they inhabit the abyss. There's very little visibility in this zone, if there's any visibility at all. And it's very, very difficult to resist the things you don't know are there. The problem is that so many of the conversations that circulate issues of mis and disinformation and the online hellscape more generally are focused on the sunlight zone, the stuff we can see and measure. And the sunlight zone matters. When you're talking about white supremacy, for example, that's where the attacks come from. You have to pay attention to it. But if you're defining the problem within the sunlight zone, that's where your solutions are going to tend to be restricted. So it becomes a conversation about moderation and deplatforming and demonetization, all of which are critical tools, and we should be having those conversations. But the sunlight zone is not the cause of the problems. Everything that's beneath the sunlight zone is. And that's where we need to direct our solutions. We need to get below the line and engage not just with what people believe, but why they believe it. And to connect the dots with the network circle, we need to also engage with the below the line network dynamics that create the conditions for falsehood to flourish. And for the kind of media wraparound that ensures, for instance, that, that a conspiratorially minded person sees apparent confirmation of their beliefs everywhere they look. In these cases, there are lots of network reasons for them to believe what they believe. They are literally surrounded by these messages. If you're thinking about someone who believes in QAnon, it's not just that they're getting it from one source. They're looking around and everything they see is confirming it thanks to recommendation algorithms and various economic incentive structures within far right media. And there's lots of below the line personal reasons that they would be drawn to those kinds of theories in the first place. And to really address and do something about those beliefs, you've got to get beneath both lines and tell a different story. One that's going to speak to the underlying influences much more effectively than snarky fact checks about how wrong or crazy they are. They might be wrong, but based on what exists beneath their lines, they're not being irrational and they're not crazy, which already is an ableist term. But that's the con that's the term that people use the most frequently. People who believe in QAnon, they're crazy. They're not. They're not. That's that's not what's happening at all. And we totally miss that. We totally miss the nuance and therefore can't thoughtfully or effectively engage with those beliefs when we're stuck up in the sunlight zone. And just mapping what's beneath, just sort of pointing our submersible headlights beneath that zone, that's not enough. These insights need to be harnessed to engage with people in a face-to-face -face way. This is a long game. This is an interpersonal game. So for example, by mapping the narratives that exist around a particular issue, vaccinations, for example, the federal government and community organizations can start to understand the lenses through which an issue is perceived by specific populations and then target community specific responses more effectively. News and entertainment media for their part can also direct stories below the line. I'm really interested right now in how entertainment media in particular can sort of create content that might be able to preempt some mis and disinformation with the goal of, for example, humanizing certain populations, journalists, for example, or countering falsehoods or cultivating trust in institutions. And educational institutions, arguably the most powerful player in addressing these kinds of social issues, they could help people better understand what's driving their actions, sort of getting beneath the line and using that information to really speak to people in a way that will be meaningful to them. And they could also, in, in uh, educational outfits could provide people tools for having meaningful below the line conversations with others. So basically teaching people about what is how you get below someone's line and how you have conversations there. Efforts, by the way, that could be easily stopped in their tracks, and this is specific to the US context right now, by all of the far right pearl clutching um, over critical race theory that's happening in the US currently whose entire purpose, I mean, the entire purpose of critical race theory, if you really wanted to distill it down, is to shine a light below the line on the structuring conditions of white supremacy in this country. White supremacy, of course, not being restricted to the United States, but speaking to that particular context, which only speaks to the need to get beneath the lines of all of the anti-racist anti activists on the far right, seeking to prevent students from learning about the truth of US history. 
So this isn't to suggest that going beneath the surface in these ways would be easy, especially considering the kind of organized, well-funded pushback against something like critical race theory and other cultural wars issues that are happening in the US. I'd be really curious to hear various, but where, wherever you and the audience are coming from, if, if you are encountering similar kinds of things and what kinds of pushback, what kinds of far-right organizational things are happening where you are too. But until the things below the line are brought into awareness, they're going to continue to exert the same invisible influence they always have. And shining those lights is hard. It's always going to be hard, but it's also the only way to, cat to get beneath the sunlight zone and catalyze meaningful change. So those are the first two ideas, both of which I believe, I hope, um, have things to offer as we consider what we can and should do in the kind of post-Trump world here in the US. And the third idea is more of a warning, which is that there exists a very tricky tension between individual solutions and structural solutions. And I'll connect this idea to the children's book as well. So building in the work, building on the work that we did in You Are Here, Ryan Miller and I are advocating for what we call ecological literacy. And ecological literacy is like media literacy in the ways that you might be familiar with and that it presents a set of best practices for navigating an increasingly complicated, increasingly distressing media environment. But it's unique in that it's focusing intently on reciprocity, interdependence, and shared responsibility. We, and we present a series of ecological metaphors. Again, I like metaphors to help explain how we fit within the online environment and to highlight the downstream consequences of our actions, regardless of what our motives will be. But this raises exactly this tension that's, that's articulated on the slide, the, between the individual and the structural. So to explain how and how we're approaching that tension, how we're navigating it in the book, I need to back up a bit and quickly run through the metaphors that we're using and the purpose of those metaphors. So the first is, is pollution as in polluted information, which highlights the broader environmental, con environmental consequences of networked information. Since pollution offline uh, in the natural world is never confined to one spot, it travels diffusely and unpredictably across the landscape. The polluted information frame also sidesteps questions of intent which is a, a workaround to the terms mis and disinformation. Unlike those two terms, polluted information doesn't care why someone spread something. It, it, it cares that it gets spread. Polluted information is also zeroing in on the environmental justice elements of, this, of these conversations, namely how online harm is unequally distributed across groups with black and brown and indigenous communities, so much more likely to be poisoned where they live and work and play. And finally, polluted information allows us to more thoughtfully consider how we all can pollute simply by going about our day to day lives. It's not just the industrial polluters or the people who actively set out to pollute that can have an enormous effect on the landscape. The polluted information metaphor, it suffuses the entire book. And it's also central to the book's other main metaphors, root systems, land cultivation and hurricanes, which I'll run through just really quickly. So the first is root systems when it's applied to online spaces. It's highlighting how information introduced on one side of the grove can swiftly filter out, feeding into surrounding groves and groves beyond that. It's reminding us that we have to be very careful about what we're adding to our networks because it's going to travel in highly unpredictable ways. And also is reminding us that pollution doesn't magically appear. It's, it's filtered in through um, network processes. And we have to pay attention to those processes to really think about what the consequences of our sharing might be. The next metaphor is land cultivation. So here it, it's highlighting how we, are inf we influence our networks in big and small positive and negative ways. This is true whether we're an influencer um, or an everyday person, that we all can have effect on our, an effect on our networks just by being in them. And it reminds us, this metaphor does, that when it comes to the spread of polluted information, motives matter a whole lot less than outcomes. We've got to focus on what ends up happening, not what somebody intended to do. And the final metaphor is hurricanes. So hurricanes, it, it's reflecting the fact that no controversy online is self-contained, like hurricanes in nature, real hurricanes. Online hurricanes are fed by all kinds of energies. 
And the metaphor reminds us that we can't separate out any one piece of a story online. We have to consider all the connected elements that fuel the controversy forward. And it, it reminds us in addition to that, that there's always more to the storm than the storm itself. It's not just the, the problematic information. It's all of the fast factors and forces that allow that information to be supercharged and to travel in the way that it does. So it, it asks us to think about structural issues as well, not just the information itself. So the idea of using these metaphors to cultivate ecological literacy, and I hinted at this a bit a uh, minute ago, is that by mapping where we fit within the online environment, we're more likely to be more careful about what we post and share and assume. And that means ideally less pollution, which is good. But the ultimate problem online isn't what individual people have done. The ultimate problem online is that our media environment was designed to spread pollution. It was designed to get people to pollute. It's not realistic to leave the cleanup to individuals, saying that it's the people's fault and saying that it's our job to fix it just lets the industrial grade polluters off the hook, allowing them to continue poisoning the landscape. And there are obvious parallels here with the climate crisis, right? The idea that, you know, if you just don't use plastic straws, we're somehow gonna solve the problem. Like, no, this is structural. We've got to deal with the structures. And this is also the whole problem of trying to solve racism by convincing individual people to be less racist. Individual people can be a real problem and very dangerous. And it is better when they aren't racist, obviously. But the root of the issue is not your racist uncle. It's all the legal and economic and social structures that sustain white supremacy, so much so that your uncle thinks you're trying to cancel him if you merely point out the existence of white privilege. The same holds for our dysfunctional information ecosystem. Individual pollution piles up, causes stress in ourselves and others, and triggers all kinds of toxic cycles. There are things we can do and should do to minimize the pollution we're spreading. Ecological thinking helps us do that. And to belabor the point, again, ultimately our informational systems and technological infrastructures are the biggest problems that we face. And this is not an easy line to walk. And in the children's book, we approach this by reiterating the value of applying ecological thinking to our everyday online lives, of making small differences where we can. But we also emphasize that the value of ecological thinking isn't restricted to everyday choices on social media. Ecological thinking is a pattern of mind. The more we apply it to smaller everyday situations, the more natural it becomes to apply that pattern, one that foregrounds connection, consequence, and shared responsibility, as I mentioned earlier, to other areas of our lives. And this includes efforts to build new systems and fight back against the systems that have failed us. These systems have failed us because they're not ecological. They're zoomed in. They're focused on negative freedoms. And they're more concerned about the me than the we. The whole point of social media platforms was to spread information as quickly as possible, to reward the most clickable content, and to bring people more of what they wanted. If that information was polluted, if the clickable content was toxic, if what people wanted was terrible or racist, well, something about the marketplace of ideas, mumble mumble freedoms, again, this is all coming from a US context, those are the kinds of justifications that get thrown about where I'm from. Basically the idea that it's fine, the system is fine. But the system isn't fine, and we are now all paying the price. This is what we need to deal with. This is the problem we need to solve for. And to tackle these enormous challenges, we have to cultivate a new landscape entirely to ensure that we all get to be happy and safe and free equally globally. And this means, and here I'm connecting some more dots, that we need to get beneath the surface and consider what beliefs, what stories, what monsters in the abyss influence the creation of certain kinds of technologies in certain kinds of ways. And then we have to disrupt that and introduce a different set of beliefs and stories and hopefully not monsters, but maybe big friendly whales so that the structural changes that need to be made can be made. 
Nothing about this is going to be easy. And that's why we don't have solutions to these problems yet. In many cases, we haven't even fully articulated what the problems are. So I wish that I could wrap up with a set of actionable plans. I can't. Still, I hope that these ideas can help generate additional ideas so that we can start thinking differently about the problems we face in the hopes that the outcomes can finally be different as well. So thank you. I look forward to any of your questions. Oh, stop.